Now, uh, this is something uh, you can see on the ordinate on the left. We're measuring flow mediated dilatation. In other words, the ability of the artery to dilate in relationship to certain diets. And you can see on the right, the worst for this would be the Atkins diet. The next worst would be the South Beach. And then the champ, the best of all, is plant-based nutrition. Now, the new kid on the block is the endothelial uh, progenitor cell. And here we go. Sorry, I didn't mean to get you through. Sort of, there we go. The endothelial progenitor cell arises from our bone marrow and replaces our senescent, injured, worn out endothelial cells. Now, you probably want to know, how can you stimulate the production of your endothelial progenitor cells? Well, there was a study that was done in, in Japan, excuse me, in Okinawa. And it consisted of following the healthiest human being on the planet, which is an Okinawan woman between the ages of 17 and 34. The group was divided in half, half were the control group and the other half were consuming five times a day, a green leafy Okinawan vegetable. And when they finished the study and they, and they measured the blood level of endothelial progenitor cells, they were strikingly higher in those women who were eating the green leafy Okinawan vegetables five times daily. Here is the actual uh, peer reviewed st study on that. The dietary intervention with Okinawan vegetables, increased circulating endothelial progenitor cells in healthy young women. And I think you'll see as we get later in this presentation into the actual treatment of disease, you will see how we uh, apply that. Now, <clears throat> there's been a lot of discussion about HDL. And for the longest time, we used to think that having a high HDL was important. Well, that all began to change a little bit when I started our, our first study in 1985. And it was mostly men. It was just simply the way that the patients were sent to me. We had no uh, uh, preconceived idea that it should be weighted so heavily in men. We did our subsequent study where we had plenty of women were involved. But in this first study with men, Remember the lower, like this, the accepted lower limit of HDL cholesterol in men is 40 milligrams per deciliter. Well, lo and behold, as soon as these men started our program, we saw their HDL cholesterol begin to drop. And it went below their, low, their accepted lower limit of 40. And they were down in their mid 30s. Uh, but I just knew that this was the right diet for them. I didn't, we, this was quite early on. Actually, Dean Ornish was noticing the same thing on the West Coast. But anyway, what we found was that with these men, uh, they were at the same time that their HDL cholesterol was lowering, they were losing weight. Their symptoms of heart disease were markedly improved. And then when we carefully measured them, they were reversing their disease together with this lower than normal level of HDL cholesterol. Now, the other thing that uh, happened about this point uh, was that Pfizer was going to invent the drug that was going to be the end of heart disease. And it was called torcetribib. It was in a pill where half of the pill was torcetribib. The other path, path was Pfizer's other drug for lowering LDL, which was called uh, Lipitor, Lipitor. And uh, it was interesting that about the time that Pfizer was going to spring this on the public, the chairman of Pfizer got a phone call from the chairman of the Independent Monitoring Committee. And he said, Mr. Pfizer, chairman, sir, we have a problem. Okay, what's that? Well. In the control group, there have been 51 deaths. However, uh, in the 
to our center bay group, there were 81 deaths. It was killing people. So fortunately, that never was exposed to the public. Now, the next thing, interesting thing that happened was Dan, uh, <coughs> Dan Rader and his team of lipid chemists from the University of Pennsylvania it, reporting in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, in the January 13th issue of, ninth, of uh, 2011, uh, they had drawn blood from 2,000 patients and measured their HDL cholesterol. Some were high, some were medium, and some were low. Then they did an interesting follow-up. They measured the capacity of each of those HDL cholesterols to do its job of reverse cholesterol transport. And they found that not infrequently, you could have a very high HDL and it was really almost worthless in terms of its anti-inflammatory function. And yet you'd have some that were really quite modest or low and it would be an absolute metabolic powerhouse. Now, therefore, uh, it was up to a group from UCLA in that same year of 2011 in February, reporting in the, uh, the journal, uh, let's see, it was in uh, National Medical Review. And what they had found, they were particularly studying that portion of the HDL molecule we call ApoA1. And ApoA1 is the protein moiety, the protein portion uh, of that uh, HDL molecule. When they, what they found was that when persons would eat the typical Western diet, they would injure that ApoA1 moiety, and that would convert your HDL cholesterol from being a powerful anti-inflammatory molecule that now made it a pro-inflammatory molecule so that your HDL was now joining with your LDL to injure you. Uh, pretty pretty for, for profound, pretty important. And it's important that I share this with all of the patients that come to the seminar that I conduct because when they go back home to their doctor and they see that they're eating plant-based, which is so protective and produces so much anti-inflammation in the body that your liver recognizes that the body is losing its inflammation and it will produce lower levels of HDL. And people who are not aware of the increased health from having that lower HDL will unnecessarily frighten or alarm the patient. Now, <clears throat> We're focusing on uh, nitric oxide, and let's just take a moment on this slide and look at the, what's on the left. If you look carefully, you will see that arginine is sitting on an arrow, and that arrow is pointed up to nitric oxide synthase, which is the enzyme contained within the endothelial cell and responsible for making nitric oxide. But arginine is supposed to be a precursor, so when the arginine goes and is converted by nitric oxide to nitric oxide, everything it seems fine. Now, some of you <clears throat> at this point may be saying something like, maybe Dr. Esselstyn doesn't get it. I'm gonna go down to the health food store and I'm gonna buy a jug of arginine and boy, I'm gonna have nitric oxide coming out of my ears. Please do not do that. Obviously, that was sort of obvious and it was tried in 2006 when a group of men who had had a recent myocardial infarction, a heart attack, were divided into two groups. One was the control group. The other group was having supplemental arginine. And in six months, the study was prematurely stopped. There were no heart attacks in the control group, but in the group taking supplemental arginine, there were six new heart attacks. Now let's go to the right-hand side and you will see ADMA over an arrow on top of an arrow. That's asymmetric dimethyl arginine, which is a normal, product, uh, normal metabolic uh, product of 
uh, protein metabolism. And the, that arrow also goes up to nitric oxide synthase, but instead of improving it, the ADME, ADMA will injure the nitric oxide synthase, decreasing the product, production of nitric oxide. Now, <clears throat> while ADMA is one way of getting rid of, excuse me, one way of getting rid of the ADMA is through the urine, and the other way, it can be metabolized away through DDAH, dimethyl arginine, dimethyl amino hydrolase. So the body has two reserves way to, to, to get rid of ADMA. Now, but it is so deleterious that if you look at patients, for instance, who are on renal dialysis, they cannot make any urine, they cannot get rid of the ADMA, and although they have this severe kidney disease, their highest mortality often is from stroke and heart attack because they do not have the production of nitric oxide because the nitric oxide synthase has been injured by ADMA. But what about the rest of us who have normal urinary output? Is there anything that we do that injures our ability to deal with ADMA? Yes, the Western diet, will injure DDAH. High cholesterol injures DDAH. High homocysteine will injure ADH. Insulin resistance will injure it. And so will diabetes and so will smoking. And every single one of those is, except smoking is going to be improved when you're eating whole food plant-based nutrition. Now, <clears throat> this lists a number of wonderful protective molecules that we have in our body. And although there are four listed because of time constraints, we're just talking to, uh, today about the endothelial cell. But I want you to rest assured that the endothelial progenitor cell, the HDL cholesterol, and dimethyl arginine, dimethyl aminohydrolase, all of those, Everything on this slide is optimized when you're eating whole food, plant-based nutrition. Now, statins have come along and they were supposed to be the miracle drug, but since they were brought, up, brought on board in 1986, it is now really quite a few years uh, since then and heart disease is still the number one killer. So <clears throat> while there obviously is some benefit from taking a statin, if you do have heart disease, for primary prevention, it seems to be rather modest. Now, <clears throat> there are a number of uh, 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 sides uh, effects here about uh, the downside of the interventions. And I happen to do a little uh, homework that I want to share with you now so you can understand that stents Stents and bypasses do have a price to pay. Let's say, for example, if you have a nation that has 1,200,000 stents per year, 1% are going to die. That's 12,000 people. Another 4% while getting their stent will have a heart attack, and that's 48,000. Now, on the other hand, if we look at bypass surgery alone, we don't do as many, so let's say 500,000. The mortality with that is 3%, so that's 15,000 who will die in getting bypass surgery. The same number who do the bypass will get a stroke, 15,000 strokes. Now, if we have to add up the mortality from stents and the mortality yearly from bypass, that's 15,000 plus 12,000, which is 27,000 people will die getting these procedures. And if you take it over a decade, it is 270,000 people will die getting these procedures. That's over a quarter of a million. And we really have to ask ourselves, can we possibly uh, do better? And what about the expense? Well, right now in Medicare, 46% of Medicare is the expense generated through cardiology. 
And <clears throat> so we really have to ask ourselves, is it possible that we can do better? This is a comment from Walter Willett of Harvard, who happens to be the director of their public health department, who says, the current path leads to increasing adiposity, diabetes mellitus, cardiovascular disease and disability, and an unfit, socially isolated popular, po population stuffed with pills and subjected to frequent palliative uh, procedures. <laughs>